Hi there, today we'll talk about video pre-training, learning to act by watching unlabeled online videos. This is by a team out of OpenAI and is the first system that successfully crafts a diamond pickaxe in Minecraft. So <laughs> apart from humans, obviously. So Minecraft has been sort of a test bed for reinforcement learning algorithms all of these years. And it's notoriously hard. If you don't know what Minecraft is, even if you do, it is a hard, hard problem. So you're in this open world, and you can essentially deconstruct any block. So the first thing is you want to punch a tree, right? This gets you wood, and then you want to craft that wood to these logs, and then you will craft these logs to that table. Crafting is done in a menu like this, like the, the top right here. Um, the crafting interface means that you have to arrange the items you have to create new items. There is a recipe book, but sometimes you also have to know what you're doing. Then you walk around in this open world. This is not a very competent player right here. Um, and you can see there's a menuing interface and so on. So this is hard, even if you have like predefined actions. But if you don't, and you just want to use the mouse and the keyboard as this system does right here, it becomes nearly impossible. So there's a progression of things to build, you know, given wooden planks and crafting tables and sticks, sticks are missing here, you can build the wooden pickaxe, with the wooden pickaxe, you can you can use that to mine cobblestone. With the cobblestone, you can then build a stone pickaxe. Uh, with the stone pickaxe, you can go even further and further. Uh, here you can see a bunch of stuff that this agent learns. This is um, tap to unmute. Well, I did it. In any case, this agent here learned to raid a village, like to look around in a village. You can see just how complex these worlds are, right? There are these villages, it's an open world, the terrain is randomly generated, and it's a completely new terrain every single time uh, you start the game. And this is why it's so incredible. Look at the amount of the items in this in this uh, chest right here. So just to give you sort of an idea of now it worked an idea of how difficult this game is. No agent has yet managed to successfully kind of progress through these things, uh, especially no agent that is not like has hard coded things in, in it like that. So here would be the full progression to the diamond pickaxe. See, we, before we saw you get until the stone pickaxe, you can use the stone pickaxe to mine iron ore. From that you can smelt the iron ore in a furnace to produce iron, you need something that's burnable. From that, you can craft an iron pickaxe, and with the iron pickaxe, you can mine the diamond if you find the diamond. Now, um, the episodes the episodes here run for ten minutes, I believe, or fifteen. We have tried this, so on our Discord, we discussed this paper, and thank you very much to everyone who participated. I've tried it, and it was pretty hard. I got to two diamonds once uh, within within two diamonds within ten minutes or 15. And the diamond pickaxe needs three diamonds. So for a human, it's already pretty hard. For a system like this, it is actually it's, it's pretty darn hard. So you can see right here, if you were to train this from a randomly initialized model, just with reinforcement learning, it doesn't work. So the entire question is, how do we get this to work in a like in the cheapest way possible? And that's where this paper comes in. So I think the fundamental question, even though it's called video, video pre training, which essentially means we have a model that's pre trained on videos. Uh, the main question is here, where do we spend our money most effectively? So let's say we have a bunch of money, right? So let's say here is a bucket. Well, it's more like a, a box. Okay. And the box is the box has dollars in it. Now, these aren't as worth as much anymore as they used to in the good old days. But in any case, how would you spend that money, right? You can go and collect labeled data, for example. So you can go to contractors and they can play the game. All right, so oopsie. You can tell them you can say, okay, this much of my money, that's kind of playing. I pay people to play the game, I record their actions, right? So and then I have a video together with the labels, the labels being the inputs of the humans. And then I have at least a data set where I can do something like behavior cloning, right? Uh, the other thing could be I could spend the money on getting 
unlabeled data. Now, if I spend the same money on unlabeled data, let's say this, this slice right here, unlabeled, uh, I suck at writing. Um, I'm going to get much more data, but they don't have labels. So can I do something with the unlabeled data? Uh, and then lastly, I can spend money on labeling itself. So let's say that the chunk here may be spent on labeling. I can also do other stuff, right? Uh, but the question is, what's the best distribution of getting your money spent and getting an agent that performs as well as as possible? Okay, I also have to spend some money on training the actual system. But well, it's open AI, they have the compute. So the way that this paper does it, which I find is quite cool, and is a good recipe for sort of future applications of if you, if you have any problem that's in this domain, uh, you might want to give this approach here a try. They, by no, they are by no means the first people who do it like this, uh, but they are the first to show that this significantly reduces your cost in getting a capable Minecraft agent. And the, it's such a general method that it's pretty much applicable almost anywhere where you have this type of problem. So what are they doing? They recognize a simple fact, namely that if you have a video sequence, video frame, 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 right? And if you want to infer kind of what's the next action, let's say, this is the past, right, you are here, and you want to infer what is the next action uh, that the agent is taking. Uh, essentially, that requires you to learn from the past to look back into the past, right, determine the next action. It's autoregressive, it's a causal model. And you know, what you essentially need to do, if you let's say you watch a video of someone playing, you have to predict what's the next action, what's the next mouse movement, what's the next key press, you have to understand what they're thinking, you have to sort of look ahead, like what might they want to do next, right? And then you can sort of predict the next action. This paper recognizes it's much simpler, if you already have the entire video sequence of past and future frames, to then from all of this, look back and forward, so you integrate all the information in hindsight, you can determine much more easily what action was in between those two frames, right? Because you see the future, you see the effects of the action, you might even see a little bit ahead of what the person, you know, is actually doing, and then you might infer their plans and so on. So that is a much easier task to infer the action from the hindsight situation than to infer the action just, just from the causal situation. And this is the basis of their method. We've seen this in other places before. I've uh, once analyzed a talk by Andre Karpati on Tesla labeling, and they're doing exactly the same thing. They're saying, wait, if you actually have the whole video sequence, and the car is hidden, and then appears again, right? If you look back in hindsight, you can determine much more easily where that car was the entire time. Same idea here. So what are they doing? They are doing two things. They're collecting labeled data first in two different ways. So the first way they collect labeled data um, is they simply tell contractors, what color is good here, they tell contractors to play the game, as we said, they sit them down, and they play for 2000 hours of video game 2000 hours of Minecraft, they just play it while their key presses and their mouse movements are all recorded, right? So that, sorry, that gives you a data set where you can train a system. Now you could run sort of behavior cloning directly on that system and try to get a good agent out of that labeled data. But no, they actually train this purple system right here. So they train a system that takes into account future and past in a given window, and then tries to determine the action of one of the frames in the middle, they call this the inverse dynamics model. Now they they have now a model that you can't really build an agent with it because the agent can never see the future. But what you can do is you can go out into the internet, and you can collect unlabeled data. YouTube, in case you have noticed happens to be full of Minecraft videos, <laughs> even I made a Minecraft video. So you know, you can go out and you can collect tons and tons and tons of 
Minecraft data. The only thing they have to do is they have to collect what they call clean data. So very often there is like a streamer in the picture, like, you know, me right here. Uh, so this is not, sorry, this is not a clean uh, paper review video. It's actually, it has me inside of it, or there'd be like a subscribe button somewhere or some something like this. So they also collect a bunch of labeled data from, from crowd workers to classify frames to clean Minecraft footage, which is Minecraft footage that has just the Minecraft interface, including the, the hot bar and um, the, the health bars and so on, but not any of the streamer information uh, and is in survival mode. If you don't know what that means, just forget about it. It's one of the game modes of Minecraft that most people play in. The others would be like creative mode and I don't even know what exists um, other than that. So you want to go, you want to collect frame uh, labels to classify clean data. You can do that pretty cheaply. In fact, I think they, from the labeled data, they, I think they run them through a ResNet, a pre-trained ResNet, and then just train a support vector machine to classify clean frames from like non-clean non frames, which, you know, is pretty simple, but it works. So all the better for that. Uh, but then they essentially have here 70,000 hours of clean but unlabeled data. And then the trick is they just use this inverse dynamic model to label the unlabeled data to have pseudo labels. Now, this obviously requires you to have very, very accurate inverse dynamics model. And in fact, uh, they do verify and and I believe they get over like a 90% accuracy in inferring the actions. So that's kind of a requirement. But once you have that, you can pseudo label all of this unlabeled video data. So you label that's what they say here, you label the videos with the inverse dynamics model. And that leads you to 70,000 hours of labeled data. And then you can do the behavior cloning, then you can run your classic, it's not reinforcement learning, it's behavior cloning, essentially learning from expert demonstrations, but they're only pseudo expert demonstrations, because the labels have been essentially propagated from a smaller set of expert demonstrations. They will show in their results that this strategy is like way cheaper, you have to collect a lot less labeled data than if you were to go the route of behavior cloning directly. And I think that's the thing that's applicable throughout sort of many, many, many problems. Not only that, they can, you know, so they can then train this behavior cloning model, this causal model right here. And then they can do multiple things, they can fine tune it on like subsets of their data. Um, they can also fine tune it with reinforcement learning to achieve certain goals. And this all becomes possible right here, because this prior just the prior of, of movement, right, these videos that they collect right here, they have no goal, it's just people playing the game. But this prior of how to move in this world of things that you can do and skills acquired is so versatile that then you can do like reinforcement learning, given a certain task and with some regularization, actually, get some good results. So we're going to dive into a little bit more detail what they do right here. But this is the basic idea. It's very simple on its face. Uh, but it is very, very effective. Now one thing I have to point out here is that they keep using this term foundation model. Um, and so they have different models right here, right? They have this inverse dynamics model here, they have the classifier for the clean data. And the the model that they train, the behavior cloning model that they train on the pseudo labeled data, the large data, that's what they call the foundation model that I don't know how much money Stanford has has given them in order to call it the foundation model. But this is essentially the pre trained model that then you can either use for zero shot application, or you can use for uh, fine tuning or further uh, behavior cloning on sub data sets. But it's just like, I have nothing. Okay, I like the name is a different debate. But just the amount of times if you read this paper, the amount of times they make sure to use the name foundation model or the word foundation is it's a bit over the top, I, I have to admit, um, you know, but to each their own. So if you uh, 
don't know like the the GPT series of models and so on, then it might be a good time to look up on on that. I have several videos on that. I'll just continue and assume that you kind of know what's going on in the uh, causal or autoregressive natural language uh, modeling world. One notable difference right here, if we're talking about causal models, non causal models, and so on is that here, they don't go from the same domain to the same domain. So this is not a because GPT three is like text as an input and then text as an output. So you can sort of do this autoregressive thing. In this case, it's frame data as input like short video sequences. And as an output, you get actions. So it's not predicting the next frames or anything like this. But you do get the actions as an output. And then you have to work together with the game or with the simulator in order to actually get a sequence. All right, so what what should we dive in first, maybe the model architecture would be another good place, or a good place to start. So I already told you that the labeling model of clean versus non clean data is a support vector machine on pre trained features. That's pretty simple. The inverse dynamics model, the purple one right here, and the behavior cloning model, the green one, are essentially the same model, except one gets to look into the future and one does not. So how does that model look? Let me see where I get some space. Um, again, let's say you have frames of video. So I'm going to draw them like this. Okay, I probably need to draw a lot of them. So yada, 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 yada. Uh, okay, this was not a good idea. I hope you can recognize that these are sequential frames of videos. I'm only going to draw the uh, inverse dynamic model for the behavior cloning model exactly the same except it can't look into the future. So let's say we want to predict the action for this frame right here. What we do first is so at the end we want we want the action. So what we do first is we run over the thing with a 3d convolution. So convolution usually is in 2d on images. But you if you extend the same principle to 3d, you can um, you can also convolve in time. So there's a 3d convolution, I believe it's a kernel size of five in the time domain. So that would be a five by k by k filter that runs over the individual like every five neighboring frames and runs over them in a convolution fashion. So this runs over the whole thing. So what you get are essentially um, another sequence of frames because if you know from a convnet, if I let it run over a sequence or over an image, I get out an image, you might have different amount of channels and so on, which is the same here, I've not drawn the channels, actually, every image here is one channel, but imagine this in four dimension. Okay. So you have this, then I believe each of these frames is passed individually through a feed forward layer or a sequence of feed forward layers so that you get embeddings. So each frame now has just single vector embeddings or this is not frame per se. So each one of these frames is obviously a combination of five frames around it. But each combination of five frames and they are overlapping, of course, you know, if you see how convolutions work, each one of those is made into an embedding. And then obviously, how how else you have a big transformer model, big transformer model that processes all of this kind of stuff and spits out, you know, essentially whatever you want, in this case, uh, the action to be taken, they have a bit of an action encoding scheme, which is hierarchical, which I don't want to go into because it's very Minecraft specific, but they do something that the amount of classes that you have here uh, doesn't blow up, but also excludes like mutually exclusive actions and so on. But that's very Minecraft specific. Uh, this part right here is essentially the video part of video pre training, like that's how you handle or that's how they handle video data. Uh, by doing convolutions in time, um, mapping to embeddings, then feeding into a transformer model. If you don't know what a transformer model is, I have a good video, it's called attention is all you need. And you can learn all about it there. So the results are pretty astounding, as I said, um, here, you can see on the left, you see the performance of the inverse uh, dynamic model, you can see that the accuracy in um, the accuracy in actually 
do they get the correct actions out of their model? Like can their model that gets to look into the future predict the correct actions? And yes, it is actually um, it is actually pretty good, you can see uh, the accuracy is rising up right here, uh, the mouse um, distance also getting better and better. And here is the here is the good what I want to say, here is one of the main results. So here you can see the validation loss of the model. Now, if you were to use just behavioral cloning on the contractor data, right here is this is a function of data set size, if you were to just use the contractor data, you would improve, but you get much better uh, loss if you use the um, inverse dynamics model because it gets to look into the future, right? It's fairly, I want to say it's fairly intuitive that if you do get to look into the future, you become much better at uh, predicting these things. So that it makes total sense uh, to train the inverse dynamics model first, and use that to label the data. So now we have some results right here. And they always give the results in sort of this form. So at the bottom, you have something like, you know, the progress of training. And um, these lines represent different items. So for example, this one right here is a crafting table. If you remember a crafting for a crafting table, you need to go collect wood, you need to craft wood into planks, and then you need to craft the planks into the crafting table. So all of this requires movement in the real world, holding holding the action to punch. Yes, you punch a tree in Minecraft, uh, then opening the crafting menu crafting twice by arranging different items in in different ways. So they tell you sort of how often these things happen, or, you know, how much how much the agent achieves these things. So this line here would be representing of this item right here, obviously, the higher it goes the more the better the agent is at crafting that thing, or the more often the agent actually has achieved crafting that thing during evaluation. So if we look at a few, yeah, a few more results, they then take that foundation model, uh, the way they call it, wait, at some point, they call, they even call it foundation data, which I found funny, um, just using the word foundation all the time. So they now take Oh, I can do this when I'm in the picture. So they can now take uh, this foundation model. And as I said, they can just measure um, how often the agent achieves either collects or crafts a given item. So the blue thing here is just the foundation model that they train, you know, just on this data, this data has no goal, it's just people playing Minecraft, they just put the agent into the world and they say and they say, what can you achieve? Okay, it can achieve something like, well, what's that basic mining, basic mining, it just means, uh, I guess it collects some blocks. Uh, pretty often the blue bars here, logs pretty often planks, well, kind of sort of often, but you can already see this is a log scale, by the way, right here. <laughs> there are other agents that do it much, much better. So what are these other agents? Well, one of them, as you can see here, is fine tuned on the keyword early game. So they go to YouTube again, and they simply filter Minecraft videos by the ones that are also having the title or with the keyword early game, which are usually beginner tutorials that kind of show you, you know, how to get off the ground at the beginning, which for a model like this, if you if you fine tune on that, and the items that we have right here, they are very basic items, they're the items that you get at the very beginning of the game. So that data set is much more representative of that gameplay. And you can see that from the blue to the green bar, there's like one order of magnitude in some of these items, which is pretty huge. And then the last thing is they train, uh, they collect another set of contractor data. And this time they tell them to build a house. So in Minecraft, you can build a house, which is also one of the first things you'll do. But now it's not early game go aimless, right? Every YouTuber does whatever. Now every contractor is tasked to build a house. So we are now in the really behavior cloning setting with a goal. And um, yeah, that's that's what we do. So the data set is targeted towards building a house. And naturally, the items that you need to build a house, I guess the stone, the stone tools, yeah, 
it's pretty good to have stone tools. Not necessary, but pretty good. Uh, but it's at least the like the wooden tools are also pretty handy when building a house. And you can see that all of the items that you need right here are much higher. There is like an increase of 213x in uh, crafting tables. <laughs> uh, all of this essentially means that if your data set is more appropriate, you'll get sort of more behavior like the data set, I guess. However, all of this is fine tuned or behavior cloned on top of the foundation model. So they first trained that pre trained model, I keep saying foundation model myself, see the, the marketing gets me. Uh, they they train on this first thing. And then after that, on top of that, they either do the fine tuning to the early game data set or the fine tuning to the house building, or as we shall see, um, they do reinforcement learning. So on top of I believe this is on top of the early game model, they now do fine tuning. So the early game model gets to somewhere, maybe here, I think it gets to like the stone tools, right. Um, and then they do reinforcement learning, while giving rewards for collecting each each of the items in the sequence right here with different weights and so on, there's a fair bit of reward shaping going on right here. So I guess you can criticize that. But reward shaping has always been the case in Minecraft, people have done much harder reward shaping for Minecraft than this, and they've never achieved anything, right. So the ability of this model to actually get to the diamond pickaxe pickaxe over here is astounding. So this here is what happens. Um, if you simply <laughs> this, this, this plot right here is it's just flexing, right? It's it's pretty useless. If you just have a randomly initialized model, and you just do reinforcement learning with their reward shaping and all, you're, you're at zero, all the lines are at zero, it achieves absolutely nothing. Right? <laughs> if you actually re reinforcement learn from that pre trained model that's been pre trained on just the full data set of Minecraft footage, you see that you get pretty far, right, you get even you get to the furnace actually right here. But the higher tools are still not in reach even after reinforcement learning. So if you then reinforcement learn from the er early game model, so you do pre training, you do behavior cloning on early game filtered keyword videos. And on top of that, you do reinforcement learning with the reward shaping, you can see that you actually do get to diamonds and to the diamond pickaxe. Uh, which is you need three diamonds for in 2.5% of the evaluation runs. And keep in mind, as far as I understand, although I have not seen this in the paper, maybe it's in the appendix, or maybe I've uh, missed it. But this is random seed. So the world, as I said, is different for every episode. Uh, that's really the, the hard part right here, um, that the world is so complex and different. So that is is pretty cool. Now we can draw a bunch of conclusions from this, I think, you know, the fact that there is such the fact that there is a big difference between this and this or, or this and the bottom two, it, it does speak highly for, you know, this approach, where you want to have a lot of labeled data in order to pre train a model. And on the basis of that, you can do reinforcement learning. And from before we know that it's way cheaper, if you first collect small set of labeled data, use the fact that you can look into the future uh, to label unlabeled data, and then use that as your bigger labeled data set. However, there is also a difference between this one and this one right here, right? Uh, because just pre training, and then doing reinforcement learning doesn't seem to be enough to reach the highest tools right here. Um, it also pays off to really have an appropriate pre training. So when you do further pre training, essentially on early game footage, then that is much more conducive on the way to getting a diamond pickaxe, which I guess to some Minecraft players is late game, but to most is still also kind of early game uh, to get your first diamond tools. And that is also pretty, pretty interesting. So it is not it is not the case that you can just go out and get any sort of data that you want, obviously, more is always better. But having the appropriate data 
is also very, very important. So whatever you can do to get that, and maybe add that then on top of the of the full uh, random data. That's kind of the best strategy, at least from this from this chart right here. So they do a bunch of uh, more experiments right here um, to, for example, see the effect of the 3D convolutions, see the effect of the inverse dynamics model of the quality of that, like what if you train it um, better or with more data and so on. But essentially, that's the paper in a nutshell. And yeah, as I said, it's pretty simple. It's certainly not something that no one has done before in principle. However, it is a pretty good demonstration of something in practice, like making a capable Minecraft agent. Uh, no one has done that. Um, this is quite a significant jump, I have, I, I believe. And the idea here, not only to do that, because I'm pretty sure OpenAI could have just paid for like tons and tons of data in order to do that. Um, but in order, like doing that, while giving us a recipe, you know, here is how you can kind of save a ton of money. Again, they're not the first to do it, but they demonstrate quite nicely that in a situation like this, it can make quite the difference. Um, yeah, and lastly, I do believe they make their model available. There is a mine, there's the competition mine RL. If you're interested in that, that's a Minecraft reinforcement learning competition. And you can take their model and you can fine tune that uh, at your heart's content. So you don't have to do that whole video pre training because that's like the training itself is pretty expensive. I, I, I thought somewhere so the inverse, okay, I've, I've lost that. But I think the inverse dynamics model training was already quite a bit vroom vroom. But then let's see, fine tuning. Uh, I, I'm not going to find it. I'm not going to find it. Right. Oh, there we go. Oh, it took nine days on 720 V100 GPUs. That's a big number. That's that's a lot of V100 <laughs> GPUs. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, so they've done that for you. You can take their model, you can fine tune it, you can uh, modify it and so on. So uh, please please do that and if if you have if you happen to have spare GPUs, you can you can send me. You can send them to me. No problem. All right, that was it for me. Uh stay hydrated. Uh see you around. Bye-bye.